I am Chris Wilson, the Reference and Adult Services Librarian. I am here to introduce Dr. Wagoner, and I'm going to do that in a couple of minutes. Um, we love her here, and we really enjoy it when she comes and spends some time with us, so we're happy to have her tonight. But she's here on um, a grant from the South Carolina Humanities, and I am asked to please say something before we begin the program. Um, what we're going to uh, do tonight is we're going to tell you that the, this particular program is sponsored by South Carolina Humanities, a not-for-profit organization, inspiring, engaging, and enriching South Carolinians with programs on literature, history, culture, and heritage. And the other thing I've been asked to tell you is we are recording this, so <laughs> it will be recorded. And so um, when we open up discussion after Gail speaks today um, and she answers your questions and discusses things with you, just bear that in mind, this is being recorded. So I'm actually gonna turn everything over to Gail now and she's gonna tell you all about herself. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Gail Wagner, and I'm recently retired from the Department of Anthropology at the University of South Carolina, Columbia, uh, where I've been working as an archaeologist for 32 years. And um, uh, just to get a little housekeeping out of the way, please mute yourself for now and then write down any questions that you have. And at the end, we can discuss as long as you want, I think. Um, uh, so any questions that you have, please just save them. And then that way we can get through, maybe they'll be answered as I go along. Um, and um, I will not be able to read chats as I'm talking. It will just be too confusing. <laughs> so, but not that you can't write things in the chat, but only nice things, right? <laughs> um, so um, uh, I've been working at this particular site in central South Carolina for 30-some um, years, and we recently uh, are in the middle right now of a five-year grant from Duke Energy um, and that stems out of their relicensing of their dams on the Watery River. And through the um, actions and initiatives of the landowners and other um, stakeholders, uh, Duke energy put aside some money for us to investigate uh, this site, which is uh, being destroyed by the river eating into it. So um, as you can see, uh, the title of the talk is Kofi a Chiefdom, and let's get started. Uh, oops, in a minute. So Kofi was the name of a chiefdom that was encountered by Hernando de Soto and other early explorers, but he was the earliest, in central South Carolina in 1540. Now, it was also the name given to the current capital of the chiefdom, so the capital town. And it's thought that a site on private property on the Watery River just south of Camden may have been Kofidicheki, the capital, at certain periods in time. So uh, what I want to talk about tonight is what is a chiefdom? Let's start out with that. And then was this site a capital in the chiefdom of Kofidicheki? And if so, when was this site the capital? When was it powerful? And then I want to describe some of the vignettes of life at this site that we've learned over our excavations during these past three years in particular and then end up by discussing whether this site was the town of Kofidicheki that was visited by the Spaniards, Hernando de Soto and or Juan Pardo in the 1500s. So what is a chiefdom? Well, a chiefdom is a territory that's controlled by a kin group. And this kin group had, had risen to political religious power. Now this map showing the extent of the chiefdom of Kofi de is entirely, we don't know. There's not been enough archeology span to actually draw boundaries to this chiefdom. So this is just a best guess right now, but you can see it's really confined to the watery Catawba Valley. On the left, you can see an artist's reconstruction of the largest capital town of a chiefdom in North America. And this was the chiefdom of Cahokia, just outside of present day St. Louis in the um, what's called the American Bottoms of the Mississippi River in Illinois. 
And um, this was uh, by far the largest uh, capital town with um, hundreds or dozens of mounds. I'm not sure how many. Uh, that very large mound that you see there had a 10 acre base. That's how big this, uh, this place was. Chiefdoms were ruled by hereditary chiefs who also controlled religion. And you're looking here at artifacts from this time period. Um, the figure on the right is a stone figure from Tennessee and the head pot on the left, I'm not sure where that's from, probably maybe Alabama is my guess. Uh, but it's always fun, I think, to see how they depicted themselves. Now, Southeastern chiefdoms were matrilineal, meaning that inheritance did not pass through the male lineage as it does in our society. You know, we frequently take our father's last name, but it passed through the female lineage. Now, this really struck Thomas Nairn, who was the South Carolina Indian agent in 1708. And he wrote, the savages reckon all their families from the mother's side and have not the least regard who is their father. And for this reason, the chief's sister's son always succeeds and never his own. Now, uh, Nairn went on to reflect, I mean, this was a totally different viewpoint than he was used to uh, coming as he did from uh, the European side of the coin, as it were. And uh, he said, well, you know, that actually makes sense. You can always, you always know who the mother is, but you're never quite sure, you know, who, who the father could be. So chiefs most often were men who inherited the position from their sisters uh, or from their uncle, from their maternal uncle. Um, now, um, however, at the time that Hernando de Soto visited Kofa de Chequi, the chiefdom, um, there, there was a woman ruler. And at the same time, there were also, I think in uh, Georgia, another chiefdom that had a woman ruler. So that wasn't always men who were the rulers. Now chiefdoms were stratified societies. That is people were born into different statuses. And at the top of the society were the elite from among whom a chief could be chosen. And archeologists always illustrate these types of societies as a triangle showing that there are relatively few people who are elite. And by far the vast majority of people in the society were what we call commoners. Now, so not only do we find kind of a, a stratigraphy or stratified uh, cultural society, we find a stratigraphy or, or a hierarchy of places where people lived. And starting at the bottom, at the smallest, they were isolated households or farmsteads that would be spread out in the countryside and supplying uh, food and other goods to the uh, capital cities. Uh, then you would have hamlets or villages. Uh, then next bigger, you might have towns that did not have a mound. Uh, and then you would have relatively few mound town centers. And these could range all the way from a, a mound town that had one mound um, to mound town centers that had multiple mounds like this huge, uh, you're looking just at the center of Cahokia, the largest mound town in North America. And this is just a, a small portion of this, uh, this site that covers uh, hundreds, hundreds of acres. And in particular, flat topped earthen mounds were built as raised platforms for temples or public structures. And here you see a reconstruction of one such mound and temple up at Town Creek in South Central North Carolina. Now, the, these people did build other types of mounds, but the hallmark of this society are these flat topped earthen mounds used to support a structure. So a capital town would have at least one platform mound. And most towns in a chiefdom would not have any mound. So for if there was an important ceremony that required use of the mound and the mound you realize would become kind of a theater platform. People could be standing down below in the plaza and watching people up above them on the mound or maybe not watching them. Maybe it, there was a screen up there, a fence and it, and it was private. But to partake in important ceremonies, people had to travel to one of the mound towns. And we know of eight mound towns in the central Watery Valley, plus another four or so mound towns further north and south along the river, some of which are now underneath Lake Wateree. So if you can date when each mound was built, or even better, when each mound had layers added, you can somewhat trace the history of where the religious political power was focused. 
So a, a chiefdom was a theocracy. And in the Watery Valley, power moved from one mound town to another through time. And we've barely begun to map the location of all these different kinds of places where the people of Kofitacheki conducted life. So I've bracketed the Watery Valley there and the, and the little red dots are sites of the correct time period. And you can see that uh, this, this uh, map is uh, a little bit out of date, but that um, there's not been a lot of archeology span done. Um, you can see a cluster of sites in Richland County, uh, that's Fort Jackson. You can see a cluster of sites in Sumter, that's Shaw Air Force Base. So at federal facilities, archeology span gets done and on private property, it doesn't get done so frequently. And up in uh, Lancaster, Kershaw counties, you see a place where a local collector has done a lot of work. Now, uh, uh, other archeologists have noticed that mound towns have an architectural grammar. So you expect to find one or more mounds around a plaza that has a central pole and then structures around that plaza. And then there may be a palisade around the entire mound precinct, or in this case of an artist reconstruction of Toqua in Tennessee, a site of the same time period uh, as ours, um, you can see that the palisade appears to be around the entire town. And let's take a look at this uh, for just a minute. You see that there are two mounds, uh, this big mound here, a central plaza with the central pole uh, on a mound over here. And then there's a palisade around all of these structures and it's a palisade that has bastions. So these are little platforms where archers could stand and protect the town against people. Now palisades also sometimes were erected not to keep people out, but to keep dangerous spirits in. <laughs> so if you have bastions, you know at least that they're trying to keep people out. And also you can see that outside the town, there, inside the town there undoubtedly are little um, gardens next to these houses, but outside there's some agricultural fields. Uh, DeSoto, when he described walking toward Kofitacheki, he said that as far as his eye could see, the road was lined with fields and scattered farmsteads, houses. Uh, and then here's a canoe landing and it looks like an entrance to the town. So um, a lot of, of good details in this artist's reconstruction. Now chiefdoms first arose in Eastern North America along the Mississippi River near St. Louis. That is Cahokia was uh, one of the first chiefdoms, is the first chiefdom that we know about. Uh, well, there might've been some a little further south, but they arose around 1000 um, and they spread from there eastward. And we are the furthest easternmost frontier of this type of society. And accompanying this social system was a system of religious thought that I'm not gonna go into detail on. But when you put these together, uh, Southeastern people who lived in chiefdoms and followed these religious beliefs, we archeologists call these people Mississippians. So the word to us, it's just a made up word coming from you know, it first arose in the Mississippi River Valley. It's a made up word saying these are Southeastern people who had these particular sets of religious beliefs that varied uh, and lived in chiefdoms. So thus Mississippian societies across the Southeast, they both shared some characteristics um, and sometimes they had this architectural grammar to their towns, uh, yet they remained unique and regional also. And we think that in some cases, Mississippian was spread by the actual movement of populations and in some cases, it arose within an NC2 local population. And we did have an NC2 local population here, but it's my working hypothesis that actually it was, in our case, in the Central Watery Valley, a movement of people from, it's now looking like, Eastern Tennessee who moved here and brought Mississippian with them and lived alongside for a while with the local people until they all got together. <laughs> So in either case, people enjoyed long distance trade and social relationships with other Mississippian societies and even with societies who were not Mississippian. So for instance, societies north of the Ohio River were a different kind of society, not living in chiefdoms. And yet we can see through the trade items that people were um, enjoying long distance trade with them. And even up into Wisconsin, for example. So was this site on private property uh, just south of uh, the town of Camden, 
the chiefdom of Kofidicheki. Well, in 1806, uh, uh, Dr. Henry Blanding of Camden um, sketched two large mounds and one of the uh, large mounds, mount, what we now call Mound B, was surrounded by eight smaller mounds. Um, so undoubtedly, um, given that there were 10 mounds at the site, um, this was a capital in the chiefdom of Kofa Decheki. And in fact, it's the largest mound town in the state of South Carolina by far. But all 10 of these mounds uh, were not built at the same time. And our research group is in the middle of a five-year grant to figure out when the mounds at this site were built and when this site was powerful. And most exciting here, just a few weeks ago, we received back 10 radiocarbon dates from the laboratory that will help us unravel some of the story at this site. And over the coming year, we'll be submitting more um, items for dating. So in modern times, only two of the mounds at this site have been tested by archeologists. And this is just to give you a, a glimpse that to a, a non-archeologist, this doesn't look like much, right? It's not, it's not someplace you would visit. <laughs> it's, so uh, one mound is almost completely gone, uh, fallen into the river, and the other mound is uh, not that visible. But these are the two large mounds that were in the sketch. In the 1890s, the Smithsonian Institution trenched the Mound A that's now almost gone, as well as one of the small mounds, Mound C. But in 1953, the remnants of Mound C were pushed into the river. Um, so it's, it's gone, except the base will still be there, we hope, we, we, we would think. And in 2020, we found what we believe is the footprint of another of the small mounds, and we've named it Mound D. So we are using what's called a gradiometer. Uh, it's, a, it's a type of a magnetometer to map the presence of features such as mounds, structures, pits, and trenches under the present surface of the ground. I mean, this is an archeologist dream, right? To be able to see exactly where a house is and then go straight to that house and investigate it. So let's spend just a minute looking at this map. The gray and black on this map are the gradiometer readings. And it's looking at positive and negative magnetic signatures. So for instance, down here is where there's a big piece of metal, a substantial piece of metal. Like, I, I don't know what, like a refrigerator door, who knows, a tractor seat. Left this black dot with the white around it, okay? Uh, so here's another piece of metal. Here's a piece of metal. Here's a big piece of metal. Um, and we were able to take the gradiometer readings only where there were no trees. So along here, there were hardwood trees, along here, hardwood trees, in here, pine trees, out here, pine trees. So this is only a small portion of the site that's been mapped with the gradiometer. And in green, the expert gradiometer guy um, has uh, put his preliminary interpretation of um, structures or any, mostly, I guess, what he thinks are structures. Now, um, in red are some of the past excavations, not all of them that have taken place at the site. So we can't map the 1890 excavations because um, they, didn't, they didn't map them well enough for us to map them. But some of these like over in here date to the 70s or 80s. Here, this line is from us in 2019. And then in blue is where we excavated in uh, 2020. Um, one other word about these gradiometer readings, these like uh, uh, here, you're seeing Mound B and it's a big long rectangle with a big thick black outline and inside all these kind of boxes. And those readings could be at any layer or level. So you don't know if this one's shallow and this one's deep, they're at different. So uh, the deeper you are, the older you are. So um, it collapses, it pancakes different time periods into the gradiometer signature. So, so far, as I said, we've mapped only where no trees uh, are growing or were growing when we did the mapping. So we can now surmise that early Mississippian people were living here by at least 1300. And their occupation was intense enough to cover this area of the site, a wide area of the site with trash resulting in what archeologists call a sheet midden. So the soil will be black from the organic remains and, and have little bits of broken trash in it. And the first evidence of mound building commenced in the early 1400s. 
with the early stages of Mound A that was adjacent to the river. And here we find on the east side of Mound A, a structure that was destroyed by fire early in the mound building. So here's a picture of that trench. And if you look at the slope here, you can see we're on the edge, the very edge of the mound of what's left and the rest of it has fallen in the river. And here you can see the underlying midden or ground surface. And on top of it here uh, in kind of two different layers and over here is a burnt structure that collapsed. So they had daubed the structure. That is they had built a wooden frame and then they had um, smacked it with dirt on both sides, like, like what today you would call an adobe structure. And then because it burnt, the clay itself hardened into ceramic-like pieces and it's preserved. And we just, uh, we just got back C14 dates. Are they here? Sorry. I guess you're covering up. Oh, there they are. Uh, I couldn't see them. Uh, so down here, we had some uh, corn dating to 1359, and I dated some uh, cane, river cane, from the structure that was used uh, to help build the structure to 1450. And that profile I just showed you was approximately in here. So this is the profile that was uh, discovered or un uh, uncovered in the 1950s uh, by some excavations at university, from the University of Georgia. And what we can tell is that construction at this mound continued from this mid 1400s, early 1400s until at least 1500, 1550. And what they did, they expanded the base of the mound further south, essentially moving the center of the mound southward and they raised the height of the mound. So when they built it, they didn't just you know, make it bigger in one spot, they changed the shape of it. Now, Mound B over here, we also found a structure immediately east of the original mound edge, and it was also burnt when mound construction commenced. And here's the uh, gradiometer's little green outline of that, and here's our trench through it. Um, and the reason it's so wide in there is that this was first dug in 1982 and 1985 because we wanted to reduce our new destructive signature uh, because digging is destructive. And there were still some excavation nails left down in there. So it left all this white with black. Uh, but this structure also dates to about 1455. Now, uh, recently, uh, we're starting to question whether this was actually a mound. It is unusually uh, long and rectangular for a mound. And was it instead a high raised platform? And we have some kind of little subtle hints that support the idea that it was a, a, raised, or, or a, a raised plaza, um, including the fact that we haven't really identified a plaza between it and Mound A. And in 2020, we discovered what we think is the remnant of one of the other small mounds, one that we're calling Mound D. And here's a profile or sideways view of the dirt uh, and here are the mound layers over here, and they're cut into later on by a pit. So this pit is more recent. Down here is the original midden, and then this gray layer, <coughs> they actually prepared a surface to build the mound on. <coughs> and pits at the top of this pre-mound midden underneath date to 1345 and 1408. So we're actually seeing a kind of a flurry of activity uh, in the 1400s. Um, now, coming back to this gradiometer structure, it got this name because we archaeologists originally thought, wow, this is a giant structure, maybe like a council house or something. It's 12 meters by 18 meters. You know, one meter is about three feet. That's a pretty darn big structure, like 36 feet by, you know, whatever three times 18 is. Well, Here's that profile that you just saw right here, and it's right here uh, along the uh, south edge of this. <laughs> so looking the other way. <laughs> um, instead, we found out, we decided that this is actually Mount D. And um, um, so it's got the thick black outline, just like Mount B has. And here's uh, my drawing of this uh, profile that you've just seen. Uh, plus where I dug out a trench to show more of it. Uh, so here's the, 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 they use soil blocks to build up the mound right there. 
And then, well, first they had the pre-mound midden uh, where people had been living in the thir from the 1300s on up. And then they uh, kind of uh, made that flat by making a prepared surface. Then they built the mound. And then later this pit got dug into it. And so over here is a little bit of mound fill. Here's mound and here's this pit. And we um, obviously need to look a little bit further to the right there. So in summary, mounds were constructed between at least the early 1400s to the mid 1500s. And during this time, this site was a capital town. Now, even after construction pauses or halts, these mounds maintain their sacredness. They're still sacred today. Um, so uh, these, this is, these are sacred places um, and uh, they maintain, um, we're, we're archaeologists are beginning to recognize that they they maintain their kind of their personhood, as it were. Now, mounds were built with two types of engine of expertise, at least engineering expertise, because how do you make a pile of dirt not erode away? Uh, and also a kind of societal ritual and religious expertise. So these two sets of expertise. Now I'd like to move on to talking about some of the vignettes, vignettes of life and lifeways at this site. So as I mentioned, mound construction was this balance between engineering know-how and then the cultural or ritual or religious uh, needs that you needed to meet. And think about this, these Mississippians had no written language and instead they depended on oral tradition. So both of these sets of knowledge, the engineering knowledge and the ritual or religious knowledge needed to be both experienced and practiced by each generation in order to accurately pass on how to do it. You know, many, many archeologists, you'll ask them, when, when did they add layers to the mound? And they will, they will say, well, when a new chief comes to power. Well, no, it's got to be every generation. Uh, Otherwise, you, you lose that information. One of the big surprises to me was that they were using sod blocks and soil blocks. What's a sod block? Well, here's one I dug up in my front pasture. So you, do, you dig up, it's like a brick out of dirt and you turn it over and the roots of the grass hold it together. It's extremely sturdy and stable. And here on the right, you see on the um, uh, east edge of Mound B, a cross section through that thick black line on the gradiometer. And these are all sod, sod blocks. How can we tell? Well, see the top ground surface has what's called an A horizon, which is usually dark. Now here it's just wet versus dry, but it's usually dark. And then the B horizon is lighter. So here is one sod block right here, dark on the bottom, that's the A horizon underneath, the B horizon, which is upside down. You know, somebody turned that dirt over. <laughs> uh, and so these are sod blocks and look, they could make a vertical wall. Isn't that incredible? And it would be very stable. Uh, and then they went out in this case and got sod blocks from somewhere else and immediately put them there. So this is like a, a single event. They put these in and then they put these in and they went and got different sod blocks somewhere else to create this two-colored two uh, wall. So this was engineering know-how. Um, oops, let's see. So here's a modern sod blocks next to profile of ancient sod block building. And again, the black is underneath uh, and, the, and the light is on top. And then these little uh, squares that you see cut out, that's from the geoarchaeological sampling to uh, learn how to interpret. So here, she actually takes these little squares of dirt at junctions and then they get plasticized and then she does thin section shavings. And uh, it's amazing what she can learn and tell us about uh, the dirt uh, based on that. So she's trying to figure out what was engineering and what was cultural. So what, what we found is that at Mound B, this thick black line from the gradiometer matches with the where you've got sod or soil blocks. And in fact, that profile you just saw was right here, uh, right through there. And we think now also that some of these interior things that look like maybe they're square structures, these are actually interior partitions made of sod blocks or soil blocks. So we had an opportunity in 2020 to test this. 
uh, we dug down to just below the base of the plow zone. So not very deep. This is as deep as the plow tines went. And in fact, you can see here, we didn't erase all the plow tines. So here's where one plow tine went. See it coming down like this. Uh, here's another one coming through here. Here's another one. There's another one. There's some more over in here. So we're just barely below the surface of the ground. And we saw this, this abrupt edge. What is that? And over here, we also saw kind of an abrupt edge. So we ended up, I put, I had uh, little trenches put through both of these. We put a little 50 centimeter trench coming along here like this uh, to take a look at the, this uh, difference. And what we found were sod, uh, soil blocks. These aren't necessarily sod blocks, but they're soil blocks. So they're soil bricks. So here in plan view, looking down, you can see the abrupt edge. And then here, in the sideways view, the profile view, here it is in a picture, here's my drawing of it, the, the soil blocks. So they built up, they did this in the interior partitions and um, Adam King says that they did the same thing in Central America with rocks. And he says it's a very fast way to, to build a stable broad surface. So think about it, if, you, if you've got the priest engineer saying, Let's pile up sod blocks here and let's make a square or rectangle. Okay, now you, you uh, people who don't know anything about engineering, but it's you're the age group and, and you're the work party for today. So all you 16 to 17 year old boys in this kin group, come over here and fill it in. So uh, it's a way to, you know, have experts and non-experts making a stable surface that is not going to spread out. Those sod blocks are going to keep it in there. Um, really fascinating. Um, what did they fill it with? Well, they went out and got like four or five different kinds of dirt and then on the ground, mixed them together. I mean, thoroughly mixed them. Look at these. These are all teeny tiny pieces of all these different kinds of dirt. And then after they were all homogenized, they filled in inside the partitions. Uh, I'm sorry, I find this really cool. So I'm a, I know I'm an archaeologist and I like dirt, but this is re really neat. And the other thing I found was that artifacts that were down in here were flat. So in other words, they didn't just shovel it in, they put it in uh, a layer at a time, you know, like a flat layer, and then sometimes deliberately laid down an artifact and put in some more stuff and laid down an artifact and put in some more stuff. So it was very, very neat. So this to me was all kind of new information. We find evidence for other ceremonies or ritual behaviors associated with sacred mound building. For example, up on top of Mound B in that shallow area that we dug, we found a deposit of broken pottery with charred plant remains. And um, I'm the paleo ethnobotanist on the project. I identify those plant remains. And um, I found that they were almost entirely charred wood and bark from the Dutchman's pipe woody vine or Aristolochia. Here's what the flowers look like. Here's what the woody vine looks like. And I know from having burnt the wood in my comparative collection, this wood smells like incense when it burns. So I think that what I have found there in this particular little uh, deposit was a primary deposit uh, of an activity rather than a secondary deposit of trash uh, where somebody was burning incense up on top of the mound or the raised plaza, whatever it was, but that was uh, also, to me, uh, pretty interesting. We also found that they were carefully preparing the ground surface prior to mound construction, and we could see this especially on the east side of Mound B, where we went out quite a ways from the mound, and the constructors cut into the current ground surface. Now, whether they were doing that to dig up sod blocks, is that where they got it? Where did they get grass? We don't know. You know, that grassy roots holding dirt together, we don't know that, but uh, whether they were just uh, cutting out sod blocks there, we don't know, but they, they leveled it. And in doing so, they mixed their current trash with earlier trash. So we have trash of more than one time period all sitting together, which is very confusing for archaeologists, right? You know, you don't expect something from uh, 100 years earlier sitting right there with something from uh, when these guys were starting to build the mounds. And then they laid down this thin layer of yellow clay and they topped it with a thin layer of round river pebbles. This is on the east side of Mound B. Now today, perhaps we'd lay down a red carpet for the mound initiation ceremonies. You know, hey, 
come come today we're going to we're going to start building the mound here's the red carpet leading up to it well they had a, a yellow clay with pebble carpet and of course they couldn't pick it up when they were done so there it was for us to find we've also found structures deliberately burnt prior to or associated with mound initiation on the east sides of both mound a and mound b we've also found shallow uh, pits crammed full of maize cobs that were deliberately burned and these are what archaeologists call cob smudge pits. And here's one in cross section. Uh, and um, I did submit some of this, uh, a piece of this cob for a date. Um, and um, uh, so here's the half of it. You know, we dug through it. Here's another uh, smudge pit right behind it. And you could use these smudge pits to, to, to help um, make uh, when you're tanning hides to help make the hides water resistant, but also it's just a way to keep mosquitoes away. So I don't know if they, what they were, why they were burning them, but they were deliberately filling them with cobs and burning them. We've also found that they went and got specific colors of dirt, sometimes offsite uh, and, and, um, and used them to either cover or veneer episodes of mound building. We've also found evidence for this site's social interactions with Mississippian folk in Eastern Tennessee, beginning uh, as with this example, as early as the period 1250 to 1350 and up into 1400 and more recently. So we actually found a uh, pottery pit that I'm uh, gonna talk about in a minute underneath where Mound D was built. Um, so prior to the initiation of building the mound, and it was full of these sherds. And on top of them was this broken fragment of a chunky stone. Now, what's cool about this chunky stone is the stone itself, this is a type of quartzite found only in Eastern Tennessee. And the style of it, this is what it would look like if it were whole, and this was big. This was uh, bigger than your hand. Um, uh, this is an Eastern Tennessee style. And over here, you see a, a stone a statue of a figure holding a chunky stone in their hand. And then here is an artist drawing out in the plains, up in the Dakotas, of uh, chunky, chunky, a mandan game played out there also. And here is the stone. What, what they would do, you would be out in the plaza and you roll the stone and then people would bet on who could throw a spear uh, to land where the chunky stone was going to stop rolling. And they had different permutations, like sometimes little lines on the spear and which line it would land next to. Uh, but there's, there's their chunky stone rolling and there's their spears that they're throwing. And we see the same thing going on here in South Carolina. And uh, these chunky stones were not personal property. They were actually corporate property. And this one had most likely been ritually broken and deliberately placed on top of the uh, pile of pottery that we found. So what about that pottery? Well, underneath Mound D, we found this pit down in the midden. So here's the, uh, it's, it begins at the top of the midden here. Uh, and then above it is that preparation where they made a level surface for the mound to be built. Um, we found an edge of a pit, what I assume is an edge. The pit goes into the walls here that we haven't dug out. And just in this little corner of the pit, we found over 600 sherds from these giant jars, like three foot tall jars. And um, uh, I have some maygrass in there and the date on it is 1345 that this pit was filled. And it's also based on the style of the pottery. So this is underneath what became the mound. Uh, and basically you see, this is, it's out of this little hole, just a little bit more than what you see here, that we got the 600 shirts. There were still shirts in the wall and going back in. And um, the chunky stone was sitting right here, right on top, that piece of the chunky stone. Now, some of the coolest shirts that we found in this pit had this design on them. And this is up near the rim, up at the top would be the upper finished edge or rim of a vessel. And this has been nicknamed the watery bug because this design has been found only in the watery valley, which is cool. And what do we think it is? Well, it most closely resembles a helgramite, which is the larval form of a Dobson fly. Now, as Adam King points out, um, this is probably not 
an actual Helgramite. It's an image of something that has the characteristics of the Helgramite. And this is not anything that shows up in any of the legends that have pass, been passed down through the years. We don't have anything that we can relate this to directly. But um, uh, he, uh, Adam has uh, points out that while they might represent some being of the beneath realm associated with storms and rain, their entire life uh, cycle can be viewed as a metaphor for the path of the soul after death. After death, the body is placed in the ground while the soul eventually alights to the path of souls and the realm of the dead. So in other words, this, this looks like a Helgramite, but it, it's not just a picture of a Helgramite. It's laden. It's got a, a whole bunch of symbolic meaning that we can only try to guess at what it meant. Um, now, when shaping these large jars that were found in this feature, the clay was stamped with designs carved in a wooden paddle. So they took a wooden paddle, kind of like a ping pong paddle, and carved designs in it. And then when the clay was still wet, they stamped the designs. And what's cool to me is that here, you can actually see the grain of the wooden paddle that was used to impress the design into the wet clay. And one of the questions that, that we were asking is, um, how many different paddles did they have? Were these different designs? And it's surprisingly difficult to tell from looking at the shirts themselves if this is the all the exact same design or a little bit different. And um, uh, Samantha McDormand uh, look, took a look at them for us, took some 3D photos and also traced these. And I think is finding that a lot of these, the same paddle was used. Uh, to create these different pots, which is also very cool. Okay, so what have we talked about so far? Well, what is a chiefdom? What is a Mississippian? Was this particular site a capital in the chiefdom of Kofidacheki? Yes, it was. When was it powerful? What well, was powerful in the 1400s and 1500s and maybe up uh, to 1700 or so. And we've covered some little vignettes of life at the site. And incidentally, I, I hope you've learned a little bit about archeology span and what we can learn from its techniques along the way. But one final question I want to address, was this site, the town of Cofidacheki that was visited by Hernando de Soto in 1540 and by Juan Pardo between 1566 and 1568. Now, both of these people, Hernando de Soto came through just once, Juan Pardo made several trips through Cofidacheki, the town and the chiefdom. Um, you, you need to look at them as being impoverished, that they were on horseback and walking and they didn't have a lot of goods from Spain with them. And the ones that they had were very precious to them. They would hang on to them. So what you're most likely to find would be some Spanish trade goods uh, like beads that they would, or uh, iron that they would uh, gift to the chiefs. Or maybe uh, you might potentially find Spanish armor fragments um, that they uh, um, would, wouldn't want to lose, or construction debris if they built forts. And Juan Pardo was building forts, and he built one at uh, the town of Cofa de Chequi. So we have found scattered nails at this site that may be Spanish, and here are three of them. And in December of 1566, Juan Pardo requested the Indians to build a house for his company at Cofa de Chequi, the town. And this house was present when he came back again in September of 1567. Now, if you think about it, if he went away and the Indians built the house, they would build the house following their techniques of building, right? He would not leave precious Spanish iron nails with them. They wouldn't know how to build a Spanish house. They would be building an Indian house, but it would be for the Spanish. Okay, but then when he came back in 1568, he established Fort Santo Tomas, <coughs> but it was burned down just a few months later, along with all the other forts that were done all the way up into North Carolina along Juan Pardo's route. Um, so, uh, and that fort would potentially have nails in it because the Spanish were constructing it, but maybe they added it on to that house that the Indians built for them. So what did we find? Well, adjacent to where one of those possible Spanish nails were found, you found this collapsed daubed wall. So again, this was an adobe structure. <laughs> it burnt. In burning, the clay burnt and then became hard and pieces of it are preserved. And you can see the impressions of like uh, the grass and the stuff that was mixed in with the clay. 
And a radiocarbon date from acorn nut meat that I found mixed in with this comes back to a date of 1562. And above it, we found a small sherd of Spanish coarse redware pottery, a rim sherd. So we potentially have uh, Fort San Tomos, or we certainly have evidence at least for Juan Pardo, if not for Hernando de Soto, assuming they both went to the same town, capital town. So here's a profile view of the unit where this stuff was found. And starting down here, uh, here was a ground surface right in here, uh, dating to uh, presumably uh, the, I believe the um, 1420s. Somebody dug a deep pit and the it got lined with yellow, thin yellow clay. Then down in the bottom of that, we dated a piece of hickory nut shell to 1421. The pit got filled in and it got filled in pretty quickly because as you'll see in a minute, we found just two pottery vessels broken throughout that fill, uh, a jar and a bowl. Then in 1562, this daub wall was, uh, this, this structure was burnt and the daub wall was collapsed or dumped here. And then there's other stuff going on up above it. There's another midden. And then here's how deep the plow has just mixed everything up. That's what we call the plow zone. But this upper midden has got totally different plant remains than this does here. So and in two other locations, the nearby Mound D and also Mound A, we have some small Spanish associated pottery shirts. So one of them is a Mexican red painted rim. The others are the same kind of pottery and they're all very small, but a couple of them are rims. So we now do finally have from archeologists evidence for Spaniards at this site. So in sum, our knowledge about and understanding of life at the site is growing by leaps and bounds, thanks to our current five-year grant from Duke Energy. And here today, we've barely skimmed the information that's coming out of our excavations and analyses. Toward the close of our 2020 field season, the 30-year-old pine trees were harvested, and we're working now to mulch the downed limbs uh, to allow the gradiometer to cover the additional 20 to 22 acres of the site. So just imagine that small map that you saw uh, expanded out to show where everything actually occurred, but it's right now too rough for a gradiometer to run over it. And otherwise in 2021, uh, 2022, 2023 will be devoted to, uh, or 2021, 2022 will be devoted to analysis and write-up um, along with some additional metal detecting possibly. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank uh, a lot of different people, um, including the Daniels family in particular, and uh, Katie Ridgway, Joey Trusdale, Adam Bowers, and of course the Duke Energy current five-year grant. Uh, we couldn't have done what we did without the students and volunteers who work with us, the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, uh, the South Carolina Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology. And of course, for this talk today, we want to thank the Humanities Council. So I'm gonna stop sharing and now we can see each other. And um, what I suggest, let me see if I can see the chat, if there's any, there we go. Okay, so now we're ready for questions. And if you would uh, raise your, oops, wait a minute. Did I lose, oh, there you are. There we go. <laughs> It can get confusing. Um, you could like raise your hand, either your literal hand if you have your, well, see, I've got, you've got so many people were on two different pages, but I think there's a reaction. So does that have a hand? Um, or just turn your, yeah, raise hands. So if you click on reactions underneath and raise your hand, I can call on you to answer a question. And then at that point, you know, turn on your, yes, uh, 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 Don, you have to turn on your sound, Don, down at the bottom left. Still got to turn it on. Is Are you stopping it, Chris? No. Okay. So bottom left, it should say mute. It clicked that, that little microphone picture. And it should turn your sound on. 
Otherwise we'll have to read lips. Uh, <laughs> while he's checking for that, does anybody else? And I can only see one page of you at a time. So I don't know, uh, I guess I can go back and forth, see if any hands come up. <laughs> no questions, oh my gosh. Yes, go ahead, uh, Marty. So Gail, you've come a long way now in really zeroing in on Spanish presence. Are you saying that the Fort San Tomas was actually in the Mound A, B, C, D site right there? Possibly. It, it, uh, we'd, you know, the fact that we have a potential Spanish nail, we don't know that it's Spanish for sure, that we have pottery, that we have a date of 1562, it could at least be this the house that the that they built that the Indians built for Juan Pardo. Um, you know, I think that Chester de Prater in the past has Thank hypothesized God. that it would have been. Um, uh, uh, oh, we'll come back to you, Don. It would have been uh, across the creek, but um, certainly, you know, to have the Spanish pottery, the date, and the um, um, it is very intriguing. <laughs> To say the least, I, I would love to find an olive jar fragments. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Don, do you want to talk? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I can't see you. I lost the picture somewhere. But oh, it might be at the bottom, a little blue thing with the camera picture. A little blue thing with the camera picture. I see a lot of little blue things. There we are. There you now go. Now I see you. Okay, first thing I wanted to say was I'm not Pat Mason, which it says on the screen. That's my wife who was in there drinking her wine. Uh, I'm Don Rossick, and we've known each other for quite a while now. I lost it again. Yeah, Don's been a long time volunteer at, the, at, this, uh, at these uh, investigations. And the last time I was talking to Chris Judge, which was a couple of years ago, he was telling me about Spanish nails or possibly Spanish nails. And I was wondering if just what other kind of artifact, Spanish artifacts may have come up and you showed me. So I'm, I'm happy with the response. There are, there is a Spanish presence there. You don't know if it's DeSoto or Pardo, I guess. Yeah, and I, I would assume that if it's Pardo, this is also the same town that DeSoto would have visited, that it was uh, it was the major chiefdom during that time period. Right. That sounds, and that was my main question, if you had found some others, and the answer yeah. was yes. And, now, and the, the Berry oh, site in North Carolina, which has a book out about it, does have oh. a lot more information. Um, and they and so they form, they, they give us an example of what we might expect to find. Right. But again, these these expeditions didn't carry much with them that they left behind. Right. You know, there's I mean, not you don't have you don't expect to find a lot of trash from the Spanish that's recognizably Spanish. I, I wouldn't be surprised. And the longer they stayed, the less they had left over, I would think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that was my main question. The rest of it was really interesting because you've really found some interesting stuff in the pre-Spanish period too. Then. Oh my gosh. Writing. <laughs> that that watery bug is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it must be. And there's nothing and, like uh, and I was thrilled <laughs> to find incense. <laughs> I know, I know. I know. That would be the, there are several things that you would never expect to find, like bricks. And well dirt bricks, yeah. Yeah. Well that's that's my question answered. Okay, I have a question from Sarah. Yes, um, Dr. Wagner, I'm a little confused. I know Duke Energy is sponsoring your grant. Um, and and what what does Duke en Energy go plan to do with that um, area? Is it going to be demolished by the river or can you fill no. me in? A little confused. That's a good question. They actually considered this to be outside of what they had to pay for impact. 
you know, so some places they're building a building or they're doing whatever, but because of stakeholders and landowner input, they agreed to uh, an input from the Department of Transportation and Archives and History and all kinds of people and archeologists in South Carolina, they agreed to throw some money this way. <laughs> so uh, they, uh, they, they say that their operation of the dams has not caused Mound A to fall into the river. And we disagree. <laughs> So the rising and lowering of the water levels has contributed to um, that mound and it's falling faster and faster. Oh, uh, Chris. Um, there's a couple of questions. Uh, well, a question and a, a response for you. The question is from um, Jessica and she wanted to know, her daughter would like to know if there are if there is any information about the food they would have eaten. Oh, Jessica, you asked the right person. So my specialty is looking at the plant remains. Now we don't have very good bone preservation. So uh, we do have a little bit and we'll be getting that analyzed in this next coming year. So we know that they were eating things like white-tailed deer and turtles. Um, so far, not many, many fish remains from this site, but we have them from another mound site south of here. But they were eating, um, they were growing maize. They were also at certain times, especially in the earlier part of this, growing maygrass, which is a grass that you've never heard of, but was an important crop for people, uh, uh, especially up in the Midwest and on the other side of the Appalachians, but it was important here too. Um, and they were uh, growing tobacco, which of course they were smoking, not eating. And um, I think we have found a little bit of squash, which doesn't always burn. Uh, so not all the plant remains are preserved for me to identify. And it turns out then they were gathering wild crops. So they, they usually let the um, passion flower or maypops grow in their fields. So I get that in most, most of the sites. I'm getting uh, some persimmon. I'm getting some black gum uh, over and over. Um, so they were eating black gum and or the trees were growing right there. More likely they were eating it and they were eating, seemed to be eating more acorns than they were hickory. Um, so they really liked acorns. <laughs> and in the early colonial records along the coast, they, the um, like John Hilton and those people who were going along the coast in their boats trying to decide where to put Charleston, uh, they talk about the acorns that they bought and or stole from the Indians along the coast. So acorns have been important in South Carolina for a long time. <laughs> so I hope that helped. Uh, so they had a very, very, a more varied diet than we do right now, perhaps. Uh, not all of which um, what I look at has to have been preserved by turning into charcoal, by burning. So there are certain things uh, that just, you know, aren't brought back and aren't burnt, but things that fall on the fire and get burnt. That's what I can find. Um, how about Samantha? Do you oh, still Dr. have a Wagner. question? Yes, Hi. I do. Um, so I'm new to the region and new to the archeology span of the region. I mostly studied Southwestern archeology span throughout my undergrad. Um, so I was wondering if you or any of your colleagues have any papers on this site or other sites around Camden um, or perhaps other sites for the Kofit Akechi people? Yes. Uh, well, there are some um, articles out, uh, for instance, in the um, uh, University of South Carolina, um, uh, the South Carolina Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology has a little magazine called Legacy. So an article came out in there on Mound D and an article came out in there on the watery bug. And of course, um, our grant reports are going to end up uh, becoming um, published also. And then this will also result in an exhibit up at the USC Lancaster um, Native American Studies Center. There's going to be a museum exhibit, uh, which will also have a little uh, video as part of the exhibit. We have a videographer been working with this. So um, we have mostly written for the general public yet. So um, and um, and there's some historic stuff, but um, not a whole lot, not a whole lot in print. Thank you. Uh -huh. Let's see. I don't know if 
somebody putting their hand up. Was there anything that people found surprising? To me, the sod blocks were big news. Already the, you know, I have to tell you the geoarchaeologist, when she saw them, she was just like, oh my gosh. Now we just last week gave a paper at a regional archaeological conference and she made me take out the word surprising <laughs> from that slide because uh, we I reused it for that talk. And um, she said, well, now there people are finding them. We expect to find them now. But let me tell you, when we first found them, she and she and all of us were astonished because we thought that was something you saw in the Midwest. We didn't know that they were using sod blocks here in South Carolina. And to me, it's also cool that we found uh, interior partitions. I don't know whether she has seen that before, interior partitions to the mound. It's not just the edge of the mound, but that they were making squares and rectangles and then filling them in. So hopefully you found that astonishing or was there anything else you found astonishing? Yeah, Marty. Oh, turn your sound on. Nope, it's, it's off again. How's there. that? Okay. Yeah. The partitions, were those rooms? Were there interior rooms or was no, it a, not, a, not a foundational structure? Right. So, and think about it. You know, the, at Cahokia, that big 10 acre base, base to the mound in, outside of St. Louis, today they have trouble keeping the sides from eroding. Well, if you had sawed blocks, that would stop that. You know, they're like bricks. I mean, they're held together by roots. They're very sturdy. <laughs> and also it would keep it if you were building, especially <laughs> it would keep it from spreading, you know? So instead of only having it on the edges, which would put a lot of pressure to pop it out, you had interior partitions. It would, it would help keep your dirt stable. So, and uh, you know, some of these mounds, today you go to a park and they're covered in grass. Back then, uh, they may very well have been naked dirt and colors. So over there's the blue mound, over there's the red mound, over there's the white mound, there's the yellow mound, or there's the striped mound. It would have been very colorful, potentially. So we archaeologists often talk about, wouldn't you like to go back for a day? And I say, uh, uh, my answer is, I think we'd be very shocked <laughs> at what we, we think was going on versus what was going on. And I think we'd also be very shocked at the kind of the smell and the sound. Uh, you know, I, I think we all tend to maybe put it more in black and white in our reconstructions. And it was, you know, people are people and they're colorful and um I think it could be, uh, you know, archaeologists could be <coughs> full of it. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> you do the best you can with the evidence that you can you can dig up. Yes, go ahead, Don. Turn your sound on again. Your sound is off, Don. should be on mine, it's the bottom left. It says mute and it looks like a microphone. You click on that. No, not yet. No, still no sound. Otherwise you can uh, write into the chat. Now I see uh, Johnny Dodge is here. He's looking at uh, a structure far east of the mounds. Have you found any, um, uh, and a lot of the pottery is very plain. So I wanna know if he's found any, um, have you found any olive jar fragments? <laughs> We're not getting any sound from you, Johnny. I don't know why. You're not muted, but yeah, there you go. 
Yeah, I think your sound is just turned down. Yeah, it, it's always been tricky on this. Um, on this, and that 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 house uh, just recently, we've gotten some good dates back for that. It seems to be around fifteen hundred that was occupied for a median date. Um, so I, it might have been earlier than the Spanish stuff, and I haven't seen anything that looks. Yeah, bad. bad. You know, that was my hope. All that plain stuff. Some of it might be wheel thrown, and we hadn't. You know, we just didn't think to look at it because. That was news to us that olive jars were being carried around in the Carolinas. Cool. Oh, we can't hear you. You're 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 maybe too far away. Your sound on your computer is way down. No, it, it's it's <laughs> my Oh, there, Don. We can hear you now. Okay, I found the unmute button finally. Uh, I forgot what I was talking about, but oh, I know what I, I've spent a lot of time in in Scotland and places like that, and Orkney, and I'm I'm just constantly amazed at how more sophisticated and knowledgeable people were than I ever thought they were, and that it came, comes clearer every day that they knew a lot of stuff that we don't know they knew. And it's, it's really impressive. And the same seems to be true here, too. Uh, yeah, these were not these were not primitive people. These were not simpler people. They were no, people they were, just like us. Yeah. You know, they got sick. They had jokes. They sang. They had colorful tattoos, colorful clothing. Um, they certainly had a society that probably like a small town, South Carolina town. Everybody knows everybody, everybody's related to everybody, and there's a lot of right. social pressure to fit in, but uh, they were people just like us. And, uh, and in fact, their, their uh, memories were prodigious because they had no written records. So they, you know, at a young age, they uh, were able to memorize what people spoke word yeah. for word. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, gosh, I, I either put you all to sleep or I explained everything. I don't know. Oh, thank you, Marty. <laughs> See so much better. <laughs> um, so we're, we're uh, don't expect to be out in the field uh, this this year or next. We're busy with the analysis. Uh, my microscope is right right behind me here. There it is. And um, except for a gradiometer, which is a one person job and, uh, mag and um, metal detecting, looking for more Spanish nails. But um, uh, we're very pleased with what we're being able to pull together and, and bring to light. And um, there's a huge amount of information from the site from past years, uh, in addition to what we've doing in this five year project. And this is the third year or five years. This is we're in year three of out of five. Right. Yeah. Okay. Or year four, year four, I guess, coming up. 2020 was our third season. So okay. 2021, 2022, the end of the grant. You must have accumulated an enormous amount of stuff. <laughs> yes. Okay, Don. I also noticed that DNR, I think it was Meg name was in there. Are they contributing to their, some of their resources to this? Oh yes, they were a huge help. Okay. So they okay. contributed people, they contributed equipment uh, and even some money. So of course people and equipment are money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, they've been a huge, a huge, huge help. And I've gone over and used their microscope also to take photographs of seeds. <laughs> Quite a setup over there. Yeah, they have the fancy microscope that I wish I had. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, what do you think, Chris? More questions. Gail, it looks like you've got two more questions. Oh, I do? Yes, one from Nina and one from Bob. Tats, when will this research be published? 
Let's see. Oh, you mean questions like hands raised? Yes. Okay, how about Nina? Hi, oh, I see the I see the hands now. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're only big and yellow. <laughs> Where'd you uh, so go, Nina? Oh, there you are. I'm here. So my question, because I'm you know I'm new here and I'm coming in on the tail end of, of your excavations at Mulberry, but I know you've been working there for years prior to this, has anyone ever excavated extensively in the residential area of the site? I know now it's more focused on the ceremonial complex area because of the erosion that's taking place. And of course it's very interesting, but I'm just curious, has, has anything been done in the residential components? No, I'm, I'm the um, first person to really be interested in the residential area. And of course they did in 1985 find the so-called mica house. 200 some meters away from the mound. So that's a residential area as it were. And so they began excavation there and I finished it. Uh, but since then um, we haven't been back. So that the residential area is of huge interest to me. Um, but because the Duke is concerned about the mound falling in the river, that's why we're concentrated up there at what's going to be destroyed uh, by falling in the river. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so we have very limited uh, knowledge. And you know, you might expect, uh, for example, different kinds of pottery. That residential commoners would have a lower grade or lower quality pottery. And the people up here in what's the mound precinct, uh, the elite would have a fancier pottery. And indeed, a lot of the pottery we are digging up is quite fancy. So we found at another site uh, down, down river a couple miles that uh, up around the mound, they were always polishing the inside of the, the vessels looked kind of like the same designs, the same types, the same sizes maybe. We, we didn't have big enough pieces to really look at their sizes. But the difference was that the pottery was fired higher and was polished on the inside up around the mound. And in the village, uh, it was fired lower. In other words, it would break sooner and not polished on the inside. So subtle differences in uh, what the commoners used versus what the elite, it was more expensive pottery for the elite. <laughs> so that was fun. So Bob, do you wanna uh, talk? Yeah, just a quick question. Um, in uh, reading some uh, articles that were published seven, eight years ago, it talked about or seemed to suggest that there was uh, some looting from the mounds uh, at that time or earlier. And, you know, if, if so, is there ever any chance to recover any of the artifacts, you know, if in fact that looting took place? Yes. Well, the, uh, the family has made efforts to recover some of that. And we archaeologists are also continue conversations with people who have those collections. Um, so yes, there, there is an effort to recover that and to bring it back to the property. Um, and looting has been going on since the late 1800s at least. Sure, yeah. So, and, and of course it is private property, so it is trespassing. And particularly if you as a looter disturb a human grave, you're disturbed, that's a breaking of federal law. Um, so you could lose everything that you had with you at that point in time, your car, your boat, whatever, uh, because of disturbing a, an Indian grave. Thank you. Yeah. You can see here the faces of the children, so many of them already severely malnourished. So, uh, Don, you might want to turn your sound off again. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think we have a TV or something. Yeah. Hey, now you know where it is. So have we have we run out of questions or um, Never. comments? Never. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, isn't, isn't that isn't that the best when you have even more questions? You know you're doing something right. <laughs> 
Okay, While Chris. We're waiting to see if anybody else has a question. I want to let you all know that at the end of this month on Monday, the 29th, at 6.30 p.m., Dr. Courtney Lewis is going to do a second for, um, portion of this. Um, she's going to do a program on American Indians 101, and please do sign up for that. The information is online and in our newsletter <laughs> so that you can pop in there and get your name signed up for this one. It's going to be just as good, and we hope and to see you all there. And, and let me say that Dr. Lewis is a uh, uh, Cherokee herself. Uh, Oklahoma Cherokee did her dissertation on the uh, Eastern Band up here in North Carolina and um, also teaches in the Department of Anthropology at University of South Carolina. Um, so I think she'll give a very good talk. So this is a whole series you're doing, isn't it, right now? Well, like your we're, theme we're, is we're doing two different ones for this month because this is um, Native American month. So we opted to do this as a celebration of that. Uh, we thank you. Well, it was nice meeting everybody. We enjoyed having you, Gail, and I know we're going to have you back another time. So I'm yeah. not going to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but thank you all so much for coming. We enjoyed it. And I think Gail enjoyed it just as much as we did. So we appreciate it, Gail, and y'all have a good evening. Goodbye, everyone.